Hey, welcome. Good crowd. Um, it's good to see everybody this nice kind of late summer day. So I, I'm, I'm of the camp that believes we have a few more weeks of summer, according to the calendar. Uh, this is a really exciting part of our seminar series that was started last year, which is the Emerging Topics Seminars. And they've been a lot of fun, and it allows us to engage new faculty from around the campus, and we've got some exciting ones that Brian will uh, mention here in a minute. Uh, you know, the most exciting thing for me as chair of the department is the students run it. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, they pick things they're interested in. They find people that they're interested in. And it brings new blood into the organization and new ideas. This particular topic is, uh, you know, it's, it's an emerging topic, but maybe like infectious diseases that emerges and reemerges. I mean, it's been around for a while. Uh, you know, Rourke Buick here, who, you know, I remember when I was a grad student, we used to work together. You know, uh, you know, I heard that he said these are common pitfalls. Well, we don't know that yet because we don't know what pitfalls we're talking about. But there's no, no doubt that data analytics is on everybody's mind today. You probably noticed that the university announced a $100 million data initiative. Uh, you know, on the 6th of October, we've got a launch of that initiative down at the Rackham Auditorium. If you haven't signed up, do so. We have 1,100 people that did sign up. It's going to be a big event, a big day. Be part of that and be part of this new um, uh, focus on data analysis, uh, you know, pitfalls and opportunities. And you know, I think I've said enough, and uh, we're glad that you're here. And uh, let's have some good talks and some good discussion. Brian? Thank you. Right. It's, uh, it's great to see a really big crowd here. You know, I thought that it was an interesting topic, and I guess that a lot of people agreed. I, I warned the speakers, you know, to expect about 30 to 40 people, and I, I guess that I kind of uh, underestimated. Um, so as Dr. Athey had mentioned, you know, we chose this because this is kind of a re-emerging topic. Sure, you know, data, data analysis has always been an issue, um, but with the rise of bioinformatics and big data, and with the lack of quantitative training in a lot of areas of biology, we thought that this is really kind of a pressing issue that's going on right now. Um, so with, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first speaker. It's going to be Dr. Uh, Daniel Amaral. So Dr. Amaral earned his PhD in statistics here at the University of Michigan, and he now works at the Institute for Social Research. Um, he works in adaptive intervention for, for medical treatments, and he specifically focuses on uh, child and adolescent, um, I'm sorry, mental health and substance abuse. And so he's here to talk to you about a, a method that's develop, being developed at the ISR. Thank you. All right. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Well, I'm really happy to be here. I'm kind of an oddball in the sense that um, I'm not part of your community necessarily, not yet. Um, I'm over at the ISR. So, and actually today I won't be talking about pitfalls per se. Um, about pitfalls of data analysis because much of my talk is about design, design of experiments. So let me just get right to it. I have 15 minutes and I have 12 slides and I hope to get through all of them in 15 minutes. So the very first thing I want to talk about is why do we need sequences of treatments and interventions? Okay, intervention science. What is a dynamic treatment regimen? I'm going to define that for you. There are some unanswered questions when we're thinking about dynamic treatment regimens. Um, I'm going to talk about, I have one single slide a, p a potentially, this, is, this may be the only slide that fits under the pitfalls idea, <laughs> um, the single only slide. As a statistician, as you guys know, as a statistician, we try not to be dogmatic and say you ought to do things this way, so I, I, I didn't want to make the talk about pitfalls. And then I, then I talk about a potential solution. This is really the exciting part, something called SMART, and I'll summarize with some take-home points. Okay, sequences of treatment are often necessary. What am I talking about? So let's think about any disorder, okay, diabetes, autism. HIV, um, the areas I work in, substance use and child and adolescent mental health. And all of these areas, most of, most of the diseases we're talking about are chronic. And because they're chronic, the disorder is waxing and waning. Because the disorder is waxing and waning and probably stays with you for a very long time, there's no sense in which we think of one treatment fixes it. Rather, we think of we manage the disorder over time. And when you're thinking about managing a disorder over time, you think about sequencing the treatments. I might give you, you might be on one medication for two years, and that might have to change, and so on and so forth. So here I try to flesh that out a little bit. Um, because of the waxing and waning course, there's multiple, but for example, in substance use, sobriety early on is often marred by relapse and multiple relapse. Well, what do we do in those situations of relapse? Okay, life events, comorbidities arise, non-adherence. You may be adherent to a certain medication for a short period of time, but if you become non-adherent, 
treatment strategy probably ought to change if you're not taking that medication. You get the idea. So there's disorders for which there's no widely effective treatment. In those settings, you might sift through various treatments until you find one that works. And then there's disorders for which there are widely effective treatments, but they are costly and burdensome. So in those settings, you might hold out the very effective flagship treatment until someone really needs it. Okay? All of these are settings in which require sequences of treatments. Is everybody with me? Um, and these are all settings in which we have high heterogeneity in response to treatment, both within person, what works for me now doesn't work for me later, and between person, what works for me doesn't necessarily work for Brian. Everybody with me? Okay, that's my, basically my lead-in slide. Now, what is a dynamic treatment regimen? Raise your hand if you have already heard of dynamic treatment regimens. I just want to get a, a taste here. Really high, be proud. Okay, good. So I'm glad I'm giving this talk. All right. <laughs> All right, so here's a definition. It's a bit of a mouthful. A dynamic treatment regimen is a sequence of individually tailored decisions, decision rules that specify whether, how, or when, and based on which measures, that, that part is key right there, to alter the dosage. Dosage means many things, duration, intensity, frequency of treatment during the course of care. If you read this again and again and again, you'll realize, hey, that sounds just like clinical practice. <laughs> In fact, the dynamic treatment regime, the whole goal of it is to help guide the type of sequential treatment decision making that doctors, clinicians, social workers make in their clinical practice. That is, in fact, the whole goal. We want to create a guide. Let me give you a concrete example. This is a very simple example, by the way, because this is an introductory talk, okay? So a concrete example, this is in child ADHD, children in schools with ADHD who are ages 6 to 12, okay? This is a very simple, adaptive, uh, dynamic treatment regimen. By the way, we call them different things. We call them treatment algorithms. We call them adaptive interventions. They go by many different names. So here's one, a simple one. I might start, I have a child with ADHD. He's in the school setting. I might start with Ritalin. We all know about Ritalin for ADHD, right? If at any point in the school year, once a month, the teacher might evaluate this child for a response, non-response, say based on two measures, say, okay? Um, and in fact, I can tell you what the two measures are. Every single month, the teacher evaluates this child for how they're responding to treatment. Everybody with me? The moment a child is identified as a non-responder, so this could happen at any month during the school year, okay? The moment a child is identified as a non-responder, they transition to an augmented strategy where I add BMOD, behavioral modification. So here I'm working with the families, I'm working with the child, they're coming in for sessions, and we're doing basically a psychotherapeutic approach in addition to the medication. Everybody with me? If, if it isn't broke, don't fix it, right? That's what the saying says. So if the, as long as the child's responding, they continue on med. This is an example, a simple example, albeit simple, of an, a dynamic treatment regimen. Everybody with me? And I can think of Many more complicated examples. Many, many of you in this room are probably, your wheels are already spinning. For example, the decision to do medication versus something else, I'm not showing that here, might be based on biological markers, right? Everybody with me? Um, it might be based on neuro, neuro, neuromarkers, genetics, right? Um, maybe the decision between medication A versus medication B. In addition, even among non-responders, the decision to do augmentation might differ, and the treatments might differ. Like, maybe instead of augmenting, I can just intensify the dose of the medication, right? Okay? So your wheels are probably spinning about all the other ways we can embellish this dynamic treatment regimen. Everybody with me? And that's good. That's what I want you to do. So in general, we could also individualize treatments using baseline factors. I talk about that. I don't do that in this example. Or other baseline time-changing biological factors. I don't do that in this example, but you can. Okay? And I thought that would interest you. DTRs, dynamic treatment regimes, are, in, are an important part of this new move toward personalized medicine, precision medicine, in a sense, okay? Because they help individualize treatments over time for the patient. Everybody with me? Okay. Okay, so you drank the Kool-Aid, right? At this point, I'm hoping you drank the Kool-Aid. So dynamic treatment regimes are way great, way cool. But there are so many unanswered questions. What do I mean by that? When the experts, the docs, the clinicians, the social workers, the psychologists sit around the room and they think, well, how exactly ought I build a good dynamic treatment regime? They have lots of questions. That's what I'm going to talk about next, unanswered questions when building a dynamic regime. Let me give you a concrete example in the context of this child ADHD example. So, medication and behavioral modification, they've been shown to be efficacious. They've been around for a very long time. So, we already have the randomized trials that say these things work. Everybody with me? However, there's much debate in this literature on whether first-line interventions should be pharmacological or behavioral. You can imagine this debate, and the debate grows stronger the younger the child is, as you can imagine, right? 
um, there's certain guilds and certain people that say we shouldn't be medicating the younger children, and there's certain people that say, well, it's safe, we have our safety data, it's perfectly fine. Further, even, even if you've settled this, there's a need for a rescue treatment if the first treatment doesn't go so well. And we know from the data, even though these are two evidence-based treatments, anywhere between 20 and 50% of children don't improve. So it's kind of like, even if you decide, you've decided what treatment to give first, we've got to decide what to do when you're a non-responder. Everybody with me? Therefore, some important questions in this setting for clinical practice include, what treatment do I begin with? And among non-responders, of which there are many, what second treatment is best? Is everybody with me? Okay. Yes? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. So, and maybe the use of the word rescue, rescue here is not a good idea. The idea is the child's not doing good on medication. Well, I need to do something about it. What is it that I do? Do I, and actually you've nailed it on the head. Do I augment the dose? Do I switch to something else and abandon it? Do I augment the medication with behavioral modification? You nailed it on the head. What is it that we ought to do? That's the second part right here. Okay. How would I have tackled this problem if I was not thinking very hard? Okay, this is my only pitfalls. <laughs> my only pitfalls. So I, I only threw this in here because the title of the, of, the, of the colloquia, okay? I only threw this idea. So I would have, and indeed I did actually, okay? Um, so let me tell you what I would have done. I would have pieced together analyses from multiple RCTs. What do I mean by that? I'll take data from one randomized trial that sought to answer, do I do medication or do I do BMOD? Everybody with me? And I'll get an answer from that randomized trial. Suppose I get medication is better. Everybody with me? All right. Then I'm going to do another study, another data analysis, where I'm going to choose the best second line treatment on the basis of a second RCT. So in this second study, I gave all the little kids medication, because that's what I found was best in the first study. And then I asked the question, among those that were non-responders, what do I do next? And then I answer that question. So I, I pieced together the analyses from two separate studies, from two separate analyses. That's what I would have done. And maybe some of you would do the same thing. What are the concerns here? And I'm not going to have a lot of time to get into it, but just think about this for a second. There's this notion of delayed therapeutic effect. Think Bellman's principle of optimality, for, for those of you that, that are more inclined to think that way. Just because a treatment works myopically now, does not mean that long term that's the thing I should have done. So what I did when I pieced together these two studies is I chose the best first line treatment on the basis of that first study and then I moved on. But that decision was a myopic one. I didn't see what happens to the child under subsequent treatments or what would happen if the child didn't respond. Everybody see that? That's the big idea. And I don't want to call this a pitfall because sometimes the piecing together might work just fine. But in this, if there are delayed therapeutic effects, to the extent that those exist, and we believe they do in intervention science, you might run into trouble. Everybody with me? Okay. So what's another approach? And I did a lot of this. This was my PhD was on. Observational comparisons, you know, and causal inference. So for example, I might take data from a big longitudinal randomized clinical trial, and I happen to observe that some children get a higher dose, and I happen to observe that some children get augmented and switch medications, and then I try to make something of the observational data. There's nothing wrong with that. I did that for a long time. But there are the typical problems associated with observational studies, right? The confounding issues and so on. And we can have lectures and lectures on that idea. So quickly we come to realize that we don't have the right data, let alone, I have five minutes, great, let alone, let alone analysis. Everybody with me? Enter SMART. Okay, so that's what I'm going to talk about next. Sequential multiple assignment randomized trials. This represents a potentially better approach. So what is a SMART? It's nothing more than a multi-stage trial, okay? The same participants run through the trial, all through the whole trial, and the trial has multiple stages of treatment. Here's an example. Back to the, uh, back to the ADHD study. I'll take, say I take 153 children, I randomize them to MED versus BMOD. Why did I do that? Because that answers the question, what do I start with? Once the child is a non-responder at any month, I re-randomize. This is the cool idea right here. I re-randomize the child to augment with the, the treatment they didn't get, or intensify the initial treatment. So if I intensify BMOD, I add a session during the week. I might add a Saturday session. If I intensify the dose, I might actually up the dose or give an afternoon dose. So everybody see me? This is an example of a SMART. Okay? So a SMART addresses in one study those two questions that I talked about earlier. And it lets me get around that problem of the optimality problem. In fact, data that arises from the SMART 
will let me understand which of these sequences is best. So if you think about it, embedded inside of the SMART are going to be four different sequences, four different dynamic treatment regimes. Start with MED, intensify or augment. Start with BMOD, intensify or augment. Everybody see that? That's the data that arises from a study. And then I'll learn which of these four strategies is best. Let me just show you the only data analysis slide, and I'm going to show you the only results slide. So here's an actual analysis of this study, okay? So here are the four regimes. It turns out both regimes that start off on medication look pretty much the same. But take a look at what happens when I start off on BMOD. Things don't look so good early on. However, however, over time, starting off on BMOD has greater gains. You see that? And in fact, we didn't see great differences here on this outcome. Yeah, go ahead. You have a question. This is real data. This is, in fact, real data. Oh, um, okay, so uh, this, there's a model on top of this, okay? So there's a piecewise linear model that's sitting on top of this, and there's a piecewise quadratic model. I have exactly one minute left. All right. All right. But what's the, what's the message here? The message here is that the kind of data that arises from the study lets you understand the trajectory under these fours. And lo and behold, we, we learn that medication is great myopically, but it might not be great in the long term. Everybody see that? Okay, take home points, and then I'm going to wrap up. All right? So dynamic treatment regimes, you learned what they are. They, they help us individualize treatment both up front and throughout. That's the big idea. That's the thing we want. That's the thing doctors want, clinicians want. SMARTs can be used to build better dynamic treatment regimes. I gave you an introduction to that idea. We'll skip this, but SMARTs are not adaptive trial designs. There's a confusing, uh, there's a confusing terminology in the literature. Okay? SMARTs aim to develop adaptive treatments, but they're not adaptive treatments. And a major theme in this intervention science is replication. I'm going to end with this idea. Brian wanted me to talk about this. Um, if you think about it, the whole goal here is to, is to try to be able to replicate what the sequences of treatments are and to understand how to best do them so that we can build our science about replicating, about sequencing treatments over time. Okay? I'm going to end there. Thank you very much. Um, so I don't want to delay uh, before the next speaker. I just want to mention that in order to, to keep things on time, if we could hold questions until the end, we'll have a question and answer panel. Yeah. So our next speaker is Dr. Jun Lee. Uh, Dr. Lee is an associate professor uh, in the, and chair for research in the Center for Computational Medicine and Bioinformatics, as well as an associate professor in uh, human genetics in the Center for Statistical Genetics and the Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, his research focuses on the basis of complex human disease using genomic approaches. All right. um, I made the slides intended for this to be the, the first talk of the three, so I had uh, more introductory material. Uh, and also aimed to uh, be uh, covering a wider range of topics uh, to try to fit the ambitious title. Uh, so I feel um, Brian really hit a very timely topic. Uh, there, these are the reasons I can think of. There is currently an uh, ongoing uh, urgent uh, conversation about research reproducibility. It has been an old topic, but it just has always been uh, quite fresh and quite urgent. Uh, and now we also have a great deal of challenge in dealing with big data. Uh, two examples, well, I know genomics, but I uh, heard of uh, big data rushing in from uh, human interaction and from social media. Uh, and of course, in medical school environment, we constantly uh, worry about how to train, train the next generation of uh, our informatics students. And in medical school, we also hope, uh, right now we don't do much, we hope to have continued education of practicing doctors and nurses and those who uh, really practice medicine, but hope they have some uh, adopt better practice for data analysis. And it's also a difficult topic because uh, it's uh, very easy to fall into an hour-long tirade about uh, uh, bad behavior. Uh, and, and also the perspectives vary. Uh, often you run into people you think who is less stringent, less careful, less stringent than you, but conversely others may see you as being overly stringent and uh, uh, paralyzing a, a good data discovery process. Another thing that made this difficult is uh, I started checking on uh, what has been said regarding pitfalls. Uh, turns out much has been said, so the challenge for all three of us is to say something fresh. 
so I want to start out with, with my own perspective. These are four uh, published studies that involved some kind of a pitfall. Uh, we, we had two studies where, at, in the age of candidate gene association, we found the widely reported uh, biologically reasonable genes actually do not or fail to replicate uh, in its reported association with autism. Then we found, uh, you know, in retrospect, it's quite trivial uh, when your cases are controlled, have different DNA quality, RNA quality, you end up having a major discovery that turned out to be a brain pH effect. Um, so uh, that's all. Uh, then the TCGA had the first paper on GBM, and then we continued to feel the, the, their discovery of subtypes are overstated. Uh, so we, including so my lab and, and including a student in the bioinformatics program, have tried to uh, reshape the narrative about GBM classification. Uh, and later on, involving another bioinformatics student, we look at the methodology and how it's been applied in, in terms of classifying samples. So that's my own uh, direct encounter. Uh, indirectly, okay, um, just very generally, almost every day you, you read papers, you, you wonder about uh, whether they have been uh, completely or, in, or halfway in the pitfall. Uh, of course, the reviewing, supervising, interaction with colleagues, or um, just every year gives me more experience and perspective on this topic. So that's my Murphy's Law, um, uh, because this has always been true to me. Uh, extraordinary discoveries have a very, very high chance, and better than other discoveries, to be wrong, and uh, often for very trivial reasons. So it doesn't need a very sophisticated uh, detective mind. You just need a little bit of uh, skepticism and a little bit of craftiness to uncover uh, that trivial reason. Uh, However, this is not always easy, so I want to make some comments about the, the culture in a uh, you know, research institute uh, and how it's challenging. Most of us don't really have time to hand check every piece of students' work. So it turned out to be, that, that turned out to be very important. So I, whenever possible, I try not to take a shortcut. But I cannot claim to have done this to, to its logical uh, extreme. That is. Uh, as uh, the, the leader of the lab, I, the best I can do is to uh, sniff the outside of the result. If I smell something wrong, I say there must be something wrong. But there is always the chance something smelled right that is still wrong. Those just will pass and eventually probably to publication. And if it blow up later, that just cannot be helped. And then there is another real thing, which is so much collaborative work, co-authors write in a minimalist fashion, and then you have to go dig. Uh, and this involves the, the uh, sociological conflict, because everybody has the ego. They, they want to they, they tell you this journal uh, values conciseness. Therefore, they didn't say everything, uh, even in supplemental material. Uh, and furthermore, there are um, a lot of project collaborators um, engage you uh, one day before the grant submission or one week before the paper submission, then that's when it's a little too late to uh, steer away the, the course of the research. So, and then there is also, uh, so these are my examples about mismeasure of evidence, or it could also be about uh, the perspective to vary. That is, most of us hoping the study can go like this. You have nothing, then you have one result. So that would be the best paper. Right? Uh, this is not too bad. You have uh, genome-wide uh, now, and then you have a signal that lifts up with a clear kink. Uh, most of us actually are motivated by finding such dream situations. We, uh, when that happens, we are extremely motivated. We drop everything to write a paper. But uh, when that is at the end state, you get engaged. You, you want to tell them, no, it's just this. Or it looks like this. Uh, we need to dig more. We need to probably tear apart the whole thing and we, we do data cleaning. That's when it's very, very difficult to, uh, to overcome the culture clash where uh, in, in team science, so now not talking about methodological pitfalls, but more of a, a social and, uh, and, and a cultural pitfall. Uh, another example would be if the real classification is this, somebody just 
uh, cut the pie into four pieces. But then if they're not careful, they find the best markers and then, so that would be a misdemeanor to say uh, the, the four classes divide this well. It could be even a greater uh, misdemeanor or a felony to choose the best best markers to say it's well classified. So this happens all the time. Uh, the marker selection uh, are the bias that uh, even the best practitioners sometimes put in. Uh, so I have one slide with four or five uh, common errors um, built from my reading and from the uh, papers I've read. Uh, one is really what's also called data dredging. That is, you, you, have the, you have the result, you report the best ones. Uh, then you kind of amplify the exploratory analysis of, and sell it as an inference. Uh, and, and then essentially confusing uh, what you have found to be consistent with the best scenario with what you have proven to be true to be the, uh, to be the case. And then the other pitfalls would be, uh, this can be addressed if uh, you really listened in the introductory statistical course. That is, you, if you have rejected it now, you have not proven the alternative, especially when you haven't considered other alternatives. Uh, and so, so again, uh, in time you develop more um, uh, fear about the unexciting alternatives, and uh, you are more passionate in chasing them down, but not everyone are as passionate uh, in finding the, the least interesting explanation of your data. And then uh, these are other ones that we see very often. So uh, even though I should have prefaced this talk by saying I have no conflict of interest, sometimes I wish there is a way if someone set up a hedge fund so I can bet against bad papers that would be uh, it would be a conflict for me to talk about this if you monetize your journal club. Uh, uh, that's an idea. Uh, I, last week I, I met a venture capitalist who read literature and recommend buy and sell of different biotech products. Uh, good, I'm doing fine. Yeah, no problem. So I said, uh, your life is easy. You just need to make a decision. Then it's a binary decision. But for me, uh, these are my students and colleagues. Cannot just bet against them and to work with them and refashion the product. Uh, so, the, I'm going to finish early. Uh, then, this is also quite often a uh, confusing significance is effect size. They, they are not all that deep, Some, but they would say, oh, my replication failed to reach significance, therefore, um, I not only, uh, therefore, I found conflicting evidence in literature. But actually, it's not. Right? You just fail to replicate because you don't have power or things like that. Uh, so I encourage you to, to read this article, a very short one, two page, about different types of analysis sometimes being uh, mischaracterized and published as a different type of analysis. Uh, I only have only one example. Um, without naming names, just tell you uh, there is a generic aging study where you have epigenome data uh, then you just regress against age. The author decided to, instead of uh, regress against the age, did a bendable age, transformed it so that it's uh, uh, exponential uh, before at a young age, then linear as an adult. So after regressing against this uh, transformed age, found 300 best markers, used that to predict the epigenomic age, then found there is a logarithmic dependency. Until adulthood, then it's linear. So curiously, the author forgot this bendable curve. Then say, uh, this is a predicted versus actual age. Made an interpretation that epigenomic marks take at a fast rate early, then constant later on. So I think it's, it's relatively trivial, uh, almost oversight by an exper experienced analyst. Uh, another paper I hope you can catch is by Sean Eddy, uh, made a strategic comment about what are the big projects intended for? So he has three terms. One is a map, one is a tool, one is a, where is it? A big signs, right, big signs. He said all of these are either for a map or for a tool, but often published as a big science paper. As if these map making effort was trying to do an experiment with positive control, negative controls, with uh, a rejection of the null, 
And sometimes these are purely observational studies on very selected cell lines that end up sold as hypothesis testing for very specific function or even evolutionary fitness. So, so it is this uh, over, uh, over ambitious claim uh, beyond what the projects actually are that give you uh, some other pitfalls. These are not, not really about uh, individual studies, but about strategic decisions on where to invest in, in uh, you know, consortium level research. Uh, the, the comment I think Sean Eddy made about brain activity maps is also, these are the tools, if they are successful, they uh, can be used in individual laboratories for very specific questions. And then none of those can really be turned into big science or brain function unless you accumulate those small signs. So my second last slide is, uh, again, the comment about what our attitude should be. If you are a student, you should try to build both. Build your tools, the, the craft of your trade, but also uh, sharpen your attitude and your instinct. Uh, and then it, some of those is hard to learn, but you, you really have to learn by practice. Uh, so this instinct, I would encourage you to be hypersensitive, just to develop the best nose to smell out unreliable influences and, and then be very experienced and think about simple, trivial, uh, alternative interpretations. Uh, another phrase I want to push out is personalized data analysis because you can treat every data set of a patient. It may it has its history, it ha may have been misdiagnosed, it has been uh, put to the wrong treatment. You need to see through its entire lifetime uh, of precision data analysis. Uh, and uh, the, the sociological part is uh, actually quite real. You, you have the expertise, but if you cannot say, say it, if you cannot say it diplomatically, you don't change the culture, you don't have the patience to change the culture, then you still get your uh, friends fall into those pitfalls. So my very last one is about the attitude uh, described by Popper. Uh, it's saying, don't, don't fall in love with hypothesis, but be passionate about your effort to refute it. So that's the best way to avoid falling into any pitfall. I'm done. The final speaker is Dr. James Joyce, who is the Cooper Harold Langford Collegiate Professor of Philosophy and Statistics in the uh, College of Lit uh, Hold on. Literature, yeah, literature, thank you. There we are. Uh, he teaches several courses in philosophy, including, I believe, uh, philosophy of science. And his research or, or interests focus on causal inference and uh, Bayesian approaches to statistics. Yeah. Um, so it's in my discipline, we come, come with paper to these things. So I've got a bunch of handouts. Um, uh, okay, so, so um, uh, when I was asked to do this, and thanks, I, um, uh, I was kind of curious how uh, and to what extent the Bayesian approaches had been making inroads uh, in bioinformatics. I gather from my, that in some small ways, but just out of curiosity, how many people are sort of familiar in some vague way with sort of Bayesian approaches to statistical inference? Okay, good, good, excellent. Okay, so. Um, I wasn't sure, so my first couple of slides are going to tell you what Bayesian inference is, but, um, but uh, once we have that, um, we'll go along. Uh, sort of the pitfall that I'm identifying here, and there is one clear pitfall, is that in, you know, as the Bayesian methods make inroads into your discipline, which they, which they surely will, um, you want to sort of guard against the following pitfall, pretending you have evidence that you don't actually have. The Bayesian makes it, well, what, what, what Bayesianism does is it makes it easy to do that. Uh, all right, so here is sort of the simplest way to describe sort of a Bayesian approach in a very simple case. You've got some observed random variable, an observable whose value depends on a parameter. Um, you've, got, you've got a likelihood function, which a Bayesian thinks of as giving you the probability of the data given values of this parameter. And then the thing that makes Bayesianism what Bayesianism is is, oops, sorry, is a prior probability function. That's where the action will be today. And these prior probability functions are, are supposed to encode all of your prior information about the problem that you have kind of coming in. And then the idea is that 
what the Bayesian idea is, is that what statistical inference involves ultimately is uh, revising probability estimates for hypotheses using your prior and the likelihood function. And the rule is, of course, Bayes' rule, which tells you I've got things nicely colored here, which says if you get certain data X and you want to know what the probability of a certain hypothesis about this parameter is, you calculate calculate as follows, you use your prior probability for the hypothesis and the likelihood function, and then you calculate the probability of the evidence, or even better, is this form. Now, it's not so crucial that you understand every bit of this. I'm going to give you an example right now, and everything I do is going to apply to this example. So I, uh, I sort of tried to make a somewhat biological example, but it's pretty lame, I agree. It's a very simple case. I wanted to choose sort of the simplest case that I could imagine. So imagine that a gene has two, two alleles A and B, uh, and imagine we have like an ancestral kind of a population, which we happen to know for some reason, just contains A, A, homozygotes, and uh, A, B. So there's no sort of B, B in the population. Um, and what's going to happen in this little, like, little experiment is we're going to learn the genotypes of 10 offspring of two parents. Um, the question we're interested in is exactly, is exactly one parent a homozygote? So it turns out we're interested in that question for some reason. And we're going to get, uh, we're going to get information in the following form. We're going to get pairs, MN, where N tells us the number of AA offspring and N is the number of AB offspring. Right. And you can have, you can have, of course, BB offspring as well. And so, uh, just, the numbers aren't so important here. I just put them down in case anybody wanted, wanted to look at them. But anyway, here's sort of the likelihood function. And then the idea is um, we're going to imagine we get some data. And I'm going to imagine we get the following data. We learn that sort of five of the offspring are AA types, and five are AB types, and none are BB types. Right? Um, uh, and the hypotheses we're going to be interested in here are is exactly one parent an AA, or are both parents AB? So those are the hypotheses we, 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 we are going to compare. And what you sort of might do in thinking about these hypotheses is you might ask, gee, what's sort of the likelihood ratio? That would be really sort of a natural thing to do. And if you do, you look at the likelihood ratio. The likelihood ratio of the one AA to the both AB hypothesis is 32, which is you know, gigantic. Um, so in other words, this is really excellent evidence in a certain sense for that hypothesis over that hypothesis. And on that basis, you might decide to reject this hypothesis. Um, uh, now, in general, what Bayesians tend to do is they don't tend to accept and reject. They aren't interested in that so much. What they want to know is what's the posterior probability of the hypothesis after the evidence. So, so, so this, this, this this is going to be the question here. And the answer to that question, this whole example is just meant to illustrate this point, the answer to this question depends on the prior. Right? So I've chosen a very sort of skewed prior here, uh, where it turns out a huge proportion of the population is of the heterozygous type. Right? And if you use this prior and the likelihood function I had before and the evidence I had before, you get this posterior here and you'll notice there's still a very large, a large sort of probability that you've got uh, two AB parents. All right, now, um, so the point of this example is just to say these priors really, really sort of matter in the whole thing, right? Um, and Here's a good question. When should you be a Bayesian? I think there's a good answer to this question. The good answer is you should be a Bayesian if you know you have a good prior. Because uh, if you know you have a good prior, there's nothing better than the Bayesian apparatus for telling you how to extract information from it, right? Um, and though I won't go, I won't, 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 won't go down this list, uh, there are sort of all kinds of sort of nice reasons to be a Bayesian when you have, have a good prior. Um, you have, a, you, know, you have a nice sort of a principled way of combining the data with your, with your prior information. That's what the sort of base theorem, base theorem it gives you. Um, you handle sort of small samples in the same way as large samples. You've got a nice simple sort of, simple sort of a theory of estimation. To make an estimation, 
and calculate an expected value using your prior. This helps with things like sort of nuisance parameters and things like that. Um, Bayesianism obeys the likelihood principle. Some people like that, some people don't. Bayesians like it. Uh, um, and I think the most important thing is it sort of gives us the kind of answer that we're really looking for. The kind of answer we're looking for is how probable is the hypothesis in light of the evidence. Right? And that's what the Bayesian apparatus is intended to do. Okay, so you should be a Bayesian if you know you have a reliable prior. Um, and I'm not going to use this slide. You know, I think there are some cases where we have pretty good priors, and those cases you should be a Bayesian. But there are other cases where um, we don't know too much. We don't know enough to have a really good prior. And the question is what to do in those cases. And this is the so-called problem of the priors. And this is what I want to speak a little bit about. How much time have I got? Seven minutes. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to skip through some of this stuff. Um, the problem of the priors is basically this. Given a certain amount of initial information, which is insufficient to convince you that you've got a good prior, what should you do? Right. Now, there are a number of different responses that Bayesians give, and I'm going to go through only one of them. One response, which I'm not going to talk about, is the most common one. Subjective Bayesians, which is uh, sort of historically, I think, the most common kind, think of, think of these priors as um, uh, sort of a kind of a codification of your prior hunches and uh, views and judgments, your personal evaluation of the situation. And I've got a couple of quotes here, uh, but I won't read them. I'm going to skip over this, this approach for, for time. Um, there's one very common and popular form of the Bayesian approach, which I'm going to call objective Bayesian. And what the objective Bayesians think is they think that there's a right way to choose a prior given a certain initial body of information. So this is a guy named E.T. Jane, a physicist, and he's got this, got this nice quote, which I'll read. Jane says, look, consistency demands that two persons with the same relevant prior information should assign the same priors. Objectivity requires that a, that a statistical analysis should make use of not of anybody's personal opinions, but rather of the specific factual data on which they're based. That sounds, sounds great. Um, uh, but there's this question still, how do we choose priors in a way that meets these conditions? Well, what James does, again, I'm skipping over some stuff here. There is. Um, uh, uh, James and others have proposed certain general rules for choosing priors. I'm going to just consider one, the sort of max entropy rule. And the maximum entropy rule says this. Um, what you want to do when you choose a prior is you want to, first of all, get all the information that you do have lined up. That, if you do it right, James says, it's going to determine a class of probability functions, usually a pretty wide class, the class consistent with the evidence. And then what you do is you go into that class and you choose the one that maximizes entropy. Because that's the one that adds the least amount of additional information to the problem. And so what James says, he says, so, so so this is how to be a Bayesian. What you're going to do is you're going to start, gather whatever evidence you have. Once you've done that, you want to maximize entropy, and then use the Bayesian apparatus. Okay, lovely little picture, sounds great. Um, here's an example of this lovely little picture. You know, let's say, suppose we somehow come into our problem, our little problem about the alloys, and we happen to know that, you know, AA moms, tend to like AA dads. Um, and so we happen to know, just making this up, that you know the, this conditional probability here is between 2 thirds and 1. And it turns out that AB moms tend to dislike AA dads. And so this conditional probability is between a quarter and a third. And then we happen to know the population of AA moms. It looks like this. Now, these three inequalities, have, I, I, I picked a very sort of easy case just because it's easy to work with, but these kind of constraints might be, you might know the value of some random variable or you might know certain events are independent or dependent, a lot of things you might know. But these three constraints here, 
they determine a class of probability functions. And then if you take that class, I've done the work here, and you apply sort of the max ent answer, it turns out you get that as the right prior. Right, so what somebody like Jane says is that's, that's the uniquely right answer to this problem. Right. And so, um, and then if I, if I sort of update on my evidence, there are five AAs and five ABs, I end up getting this posterior probability here, and you'll notice I get to draw quite striking conclusions like the, the probability that an AB mom, given this evidence, mates with an AA dad is 0.9411. Now, when I look at that number, particularly when I start to look at the, with the fourth decimal place that I gave you, that to me looks a little bit precise. Uh, it, it looks to me like I, I've done something wrong if I've gotten an answer that good out of information that bad. Um, and this is, I think, the core objection to, to, to Bayesian approaches, which goes back to Fisher. Um, uh, and Fisher, I'm just going to sort of read his, he basically, well, I won't read it. He basically, he basically said this, look, I understand that you Bayesians have these ways of choosing priors that are supposed to be, they're supposed to somehow give you the priors that add the least amount of information into the problem. But in fact, even if that's true, when you settle on a single sharp prior, you introduce lots of information into the problem that you don't already have. Right? So, so what Fisher says is, is, is he objects to Bayesianism on the grounds that, as he says, it's abstract, it, it extracts a vital piece of knowledge, the exact form of the distribution, out of ignorance, complete ignorance. Right? And if you're impressed by this, there's a question about what to do. Well, one thing you could do is you could be Fisher and say, Eliminate the Bayesian approach altogether. And I, there's a book that I included um, uh, in, in the references. This is a great discussion of sort of Fisher on Bayesianism in the 30s. It's really interesting. It's really sort of, sort of a well done book. Um, there's another alternative, however, which how much time have I got? Two minutes. I got two minutes to give you an, an alternative. That's it. Two slides, two minutes. Um, uh, there's another approach that sort of begins in begins actually in the 60s, but it sort of doesn't get pursued very much, but has become relatively sort of, sort of relatively more, 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 more sort of popular in sort of recent years. And this is the kind of thing that maybe uh, on a new a direction kind of a talk you might want to think about. This is imprecise Bayesianism. And the idea, I sort of love this quote from Peter Wally. He says, the problem is not that Bayesians have yet to discover truly uninformative priors. Right? So that's not the problem. Bayesian spent all this time trying to figure out the right sort of recipe to find a prior that would capture their information. That's not the problem. The problem is that no precise probability distribution can accurately represent ignorance. And so what the imprecise probability approach does is it says, well, look, don't try to be more precise than your initial data allows. If your initial data, as it often will, only places um, incomplete constraints on what your prior probability should look like. You got to learn to live with those constraints and treat the prior not as a single sort of a probability function, but as a but as as a set of them. Um, and I've just given you the whole this is the whole theory right here, basically in three lines. What the idea is is um, if we go back here, the imprecise probability approach says, you know, once you get here, you've defined a class of probability functions, stop, gather your evidence, um, and then update piece by piece. The idea is for each one of the probabilities, you update on that evidence, then you're going to be able to have sort of a posterior, which, is, which itself is a set of probability functions, and then the idea is you get to sort of draw inferences of the following form, if everything in that set agrees about some fact, then you can, you can make that inference, for example, in the problem we had above, it turns out you can say, oh gee, the probability that an AB mom will mate with an AB dad is, is at least 0.914, but that's the best you can do. Um, and then 
in the thing I handed out, you'll see one of the, one of the nice things about the imprecise approach is, is it, it it allows you to express a, a wide range of relationships that you can't express in other ways. Okay, thank you. So I, I think that we've had three really great, if, if very fast talks. We could talk about this for a long time, but. I hope that these uh, talks have convinced you that this is a, an important and a difficult challenge for us to face in the future. Um, we're going to have a quick question and answer session uh, right now. And so if the panelists could, could come, we have some microphones set up and water. Um, but while we're getting down here, you know, you saw that the problem is, is very complicated and not always just a problem of mathematics. There's cultural problems and there's, there's inference problems. Um, you found that sometimes the, the analysis that you need to do to figure out what your data says doesn't even exist. Uh, which can be, of course, a major problem. And then it can be clear that sometimes we come with, with preconceptions about how statistics work that, that are just not really quite correct and it's a lot more complicated. Um, so there's a whole wide range of questions that could be arising here um, and we have three experts here to talk to you about whatever you want to ask. Um, two of us will be going around with microphones, so if you have a question, please just raise your hand. Um, I know that when talking about pitfalls in analysis, a lot of the attention is given to talking about what researchers should do while formulating experiments. And sometimes it seems like a lot of that advice falls on deaf ears. I recently read a paper uh, wherein the first author had a master's degree in biostatistics. And they were doing a comparison physiologically between animals under two different conditions, compared 60 parameters. Uh, two of them came up as barely statistically significant with tiny effect sizes, and they trumpeted these results with no multiple comparison control. Um, so it seems like sometimes people fall prey to pitfalls even when they shouldn't. And my question is, do you think it would be legitimate or appropriate to try to put an explicit data analysis pitfall control of some kind into the review process? Would that be feasible? Would it be appropriate? Or is that not... Would that be cumbersome or even counterproductive? What do you think? This is a great question. Um, I'm going to take the lead if it's okay with the other panelists. If I understand you correctly, um, you asked whether it might be appropriate to put together um, your data analysis plan ahead of time and maybe put write that up and put it somewhere. Is that, I think that, well, I think that that might have been your question. Um, and part of the review process yeah. is to include a separate review of that analysis. Yeah. So let me, let me answer the question. Maybe it's not a direct answer, okay? But uh, we talked about this in preparing for today's panel. So it's kind of an indirect answer to your question. So there is a history, and I don't know how it is in bioinformatics, but in intervention science, there's a culture right now of publishing your design, just the design. The data collection process, you publish the actual design and how you plan to analyze the data. And, you, and that paper gets published way before you ever actually even see the data. And so there's a culture of that developing in intervention science. The journal editors are on board with this idea. And the, and the reason they're excited about that is because it helps ensure the replicability. Because you can look back at that published paper three years ago and see if what you did is actually what you said you were going to do. And if it is close to it or identical, you have greater faith in the results of that. So it's akin to clinical trial registry with one caveat. This publication actually lays out what the actual data analysis plan would be when the data comes in. When you, when you register a clinical trial, you don't always actually lay out the entire analysis plan. So this helps a little bit. It's an indirect answer to your question. What, what I would like the panel, and I think all three can, of you can maybe address this issue, is how to put the human factor into the problems that we have with pitfalls. So uh, it, you could put it in as a Bayesian. You could put, say that a prior could be that people want to have careers, people want to have papers, and people have biases in their thinking. They have biases in their hypotheses being correct, but they also have biases, and I want this to be published, and that is certainly part of why uh, June's pitfalls are happening, because students tend to want or need a thesis in order to 
to get on, and journals don't like papers that say, I tried hard to show X, Y, Z, but I couldn't. And so I think this reminds me a little bit of what happened in economics earlier, where people were making all kinds of wonderful models of how people should behave, but they don't behave the way economists predict because people don't act like a mathematically, statistically trained robot that knows exactly how to, how to behave. And I think it's also true for what you were talking about. Some people believe in behavioral therapies and some people believe in drugs. And how that works in these people may affect the outcomes. So how can this bias of people's thinking be incorporated into science? Uh, Margie, I don't quite actually get your question, but I want to comment on together with the previous uh, question um, about the publication process. It, it's, of course, it's a mechanism for peers to tell each other what um, they, they think each other's work represents. Uh, it would be nice, what you said made me think, it would be nice that we write papers with a very a Bayesian frame of mind that is, in your introductory, uh, lay out clearly what the prior is. In your discussion, lay out exactly what is updated information is. Perhaps that will help the reader see more clearly uh, what advance you have made. Uh, often, we don't do that. We, we write a paper uh, just reporting the posterior it's actually hard to know whether that's already known prior before the study has been, been conducted. And, and, and I guess we, we kind of have to ask a little bit about sort of the institutions. I think this is true in every academic discipline where there's, you know, very great pressure on, on sort of young people to publish in particular. Um, you know, you, you need you need to get some papers out of your dissertation if you don't do that early. Um, there are also, uh, I suspect it's true in every discipline, there are also what, what I've heard sometimes called sort of write-only journals, um, which, you know, sort of journals that people submit things to, but the papers tend not really to get read. Uh, um, uh, so. <laughs> So you know, read only, write only. That's uh, 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 um, uh, um, but I mean, I think with those incentives in place, it's going to be you know, it's going to be extremely hard to get people to avoid certain pitfalls because if it's if it's if it's so strongly in your interest to you know get a significant result to get a paper that's going to be accepted, um, and if sometimes the cost of having a paper that's wrong or accepted aren't really existent since the paper won't be widely read, then it seems like you're, you're in a position where you're sort of asking for exactly the kind of problems that we're talking about here. This is, I think this is a hard topic. I think, because um, I totally agree, right? We have students, they're doing all this hard work. They want a product out of it. I think at the end of the day, we, we, I'm going to follow June's advice if I interpret it correctly. We, we just, I think we have to coach ourselves and our students to have that certain moral, moral ground and that ethics. So if what you did ultimately was a massive data analysis, massive comparisons with massive amounts of searching for an effect, try your, try your best to be above water about that idea and the fact that this, was, this is a hypothesis generating analysis. There's absolutely nothing wrong with being above water with that, at least in my culture, in the intervention science culture. If I write a manuscript and I say, this was a hypothesis generating analysis. That's how I'm describing it. Um, and you're, you're trying to, uh, being above water about it, and, right? I, and I know that's hard, but I think, I think that's the best we can do is just coach ourselves and coach our students to have that higher moral ground. I don't know. I don't know any other way around it, to be honest. Um, there we go. <laughs> So we are living in a big data kind of environment uh, these days. We have the ability to acquire all kinds of dimensions of data about people, objects, anything that we, we put our minds on. I was wondering if you have some suggestions about certain types of data that we can acquire in order to overcome some of the pitfalls that you have outlined. 
in your presentation. Uh, I, I think the, the, the question, um, the spirit of the question is, uh, can we be smarter of gathering data? I think it's absolutely important because um, our national leaders sometimes think all they need to do is to aggregate existing data. So I'm speaking of with several examples in mind. Um, after 9-11, the people learned the lesson thinking we just need to pull the CIA data with the FBI data. Maybe we could have learned so much. So, and then uh, in, in the world of psychiatric genetics, there is also the idea that we should just pull uh, different confederates of data in the same uh, warehouse. Um, perhaps insight or knowledge or uh, true wisdom will just automatically rise above it. So, so I think that's uh, quite misleading. The, um, just by adding one pile of noise to another pile of noise, you don't get a signal. Uh, th therefore, the investment, uh, whether it's in the uh, national security or in genomic data mining or pre precision medicine, should be more on algorithm and on collecting the right amount of data. But unfortunately, we, we rarely invest in that. You, you don't find a faculty who is 100% mission is to do biobanking and uh, do, do record keeping, generating prospective data. So much investment is on uh, building new database or analyzing existing data, and there is this illusion of having already enough existing data too. But what we have are not. We have samples of convenience in everybody's freezers collected for all those idiosyncratic reasons. They are actually terribly inadequate for doing research. Um, for, for our bipolar disorder, schizophrenia disorder, we, we know very little about people's uh, clinical history or drug history. We just have the DNA in the freezer. Uh, so I think that needs to be resolved. Um, I think my talk was on this topic. Uh, my talk was precisely on this idea that um, I'm not going to talk about data analysis or finding the right data analysis. It was on, oh, you want to you want to discover how to best build on a dynamic treatment regime? Well, let me talk to you about a study design that will help you collect that data. Uh, in the world I live in, actually, all of my projects, every single project I have, uh, has a data collection component, and um, we're out gathering data to answer a particular question. I just want to add on on your on your question, is that. If you're in that situation where you have a burning scientific question you want to answer and the data doesn't exist, you can develop the tools, the methods that would allow you or somebody else to collect that data. That is a methodological advance. And so you can write that up. You can think about that. That could be, that could be part of your scholarship. Just one more question before I, I think that that's pretty much going to be it. I was given this before the talk. Um, and this is actually from uh, Dr. Kurt Bagney from Data Speaks. Um, and I think that it's, it's related, of course, to biology, but also to general questions and statistics about outliers and, and distributions. And that is, group averages wash out the effects of individual differences in, that genomics accentuates. So is unnecessary use of group averages to assess causality, as in, for instance, uh, conventional clinical trial designs, is this a pitfall in data analysis? Or is this something more necessary that we can't really avoid? Yeah, I, I read that inquiry uh, earlier in an email, um, so, so I had some time to think about it. The, the question is actually about uh, the granularity in decision making. Uh, of course, we all have the intuition uh, we, that in empirical studies, we don't know the level of classification that's just right for decision making. If you uh, divide people into large groups, you suffer the heterogeneity within the group, but if you over uh, divide, you or you doing the truly individualized medicine, then you learn no lesson for anybody else. Uh, so it's still not good. Uh, so the trick is still the empirical research on the right granularity that uh, take, takes a lot of time to to build. I have a question for Daniel about the dynamic uh, decision making. Uh, while you were talking, I think it sounded very much like, even though it's a very uh, 
kind of far field example, very much like writing a program for playing chess because you want to play your next move conditional on all the moves that have been played before. So what happened in that field, the, uh, the, the, we know computer chess is now better than human. It's actually not due to uh, tremendous conceptual advance in understanding humans' uh, decision-making and pattern recognition. It's disappointingly, it's a triumph of brute force computing and learning from a database of, say, 100,000 previously played games. So it's, a, it's almost a recap on previously played um, next move, uh, how the outcome is. Uh, I guess that's not quite possible for your design because you rarely have 100,000 previous trials to learn from. Uh, but is there a way to uh, combine however limited prior data uh, with your best judgment on how to design a bifurcating um, decision trees? Yeah, that, that's a hard question. It's really interesting. Um, okay, I think, I think the ultimate idea that you're dynamically programming, you know, mm -hmm. that you're trying to decide what to do now that's going to get me to the best move later, that is a kind of an underlying idea. Um, and that idea is, is, is the same idea in that situation as it was here. Um, I don't really have an answer to your question about how I can build in prior data yeah. about, um, and it dovetails a little bit with, with James, um, James talk. I don't have an exact answer except that, except that when clinicians come to this problem, they, their hypotheses are based on their clinical expertise and their prior data. Their hypotheses both about um, what the next question ought to be and what the, what the patient characteristics are for someone who might benefit from one treatment or the other. And those can be tested with the data that arises from the designs that I talked about. That's the closest I can get to answering your question. Yeah, sounded mm -hmm. like the best case scenario is for all the practitioners to have this uh, national centralized data so that right. that information can be built up. Right, right, that's true. We, we could have a, a way to um, have all the hypotheses in place and see which ones are the strongest. Yeah. Imagine that. Uh, just a quick question about the statistics part. So, like, we cover a lot about this, and uh, so for bioinformatics students, the statistics is required. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happens, like, we take that course, and they teach a lot about like how we're constructing uh, hypothesis testing. And after that, we feel like, yeah, great, we now have tools to construct our tests, right? Even if like common tests doesn't work, we can find some way to fit our tests against the data. And, there are a lot of the comics that mocks on that say, you know, like if p value does not show significance, what you do next step, right? And eventually what happens, like late earlier this year, not bioinformatics, but a journal in social science says, like we now reject all paper that's using p value as a, their, 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 their evidence to show significance. And of course, there's a lot of uh, debate at that time. So I would like, to ask like a, you know, your comments on this kind of a reaction. Yeah, I don't know about, um, so is this a particular journal that said that? Yeah, it was a, I forget what type of journal. It was like a psychology journal that said they just uh -huh. don't use p-values anymore because we don't think they're valid evidence or something. I, don't know. I think, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't have an answer for these. These are hard questions. I don't have an answer, but I think this comes back to the very first question and my, my kind of gut response to it. Um, so the whole notion of the p-value and all that stuff, right, um, that's based on one procedure, you know, using it one time. It's not based on a search. It's not based on repeated, you know, June talked about this a little bit, okay? And so to the extent that we can kind of like, um, my only response is what I said earlier, to the extent that we can write up ahead of time what the design was, what my planned analysis was, then that p-value you report later might actually be meaningful. That's my only response to that. And in those settings where I tell the world what my analysis plan was going to be, and then I share it with you, that actually is a meaningful p-value in that setting. I could or close to it. Yeah, yeah. And I, uh, I can't remember which journal it was either, but when I heard that, I was trying to figure out what, what had motivated them. Uh, and my hunch is something like this. P-values are so widely misused that they just decided we're going to get rid of them, like, you know. But, you know, if, 
if you found out that people were using sort of sledgehammers to fix TVs and that that was a bad thing, you wouldn't ban sledgehammers, I think. Rather, you'd say, well, you've got to use them properly. So, so you know, PWs, of course, can be really useful things. Um, but, I mean, I think a part of it is, is to... Um, uh, um, you know, to have procedures in place where it's not sufficient as it was, I think, in some journals for some time to, you know, show a statistically a significant event that, w that was enough to get it published. And so I think, I think this is an over a reaction for sure. I don't doubt that t-values get misused a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, you know, you don't want to get rid of a sort of useful tool just because people sometimes misuse it. My reaction is, uh, in my field, uh, genetics and genomics, p-value is still very useful, although I have my own uh, graduates have been uh, for its misuse. Uh, one kind is to uh, have a tiny effect, but with a tremendous p-value, mm -hmm. so the sample size is there. As tall as a mountain, so you kind of have one percent effect, uh, have a p of minus to minus incredible, so that happened. Um, another is to miss specifying the null hypothesis um, to set it up to be so easy to reject, uh, and uh, uh, we end up learning nothing. So, so those are the misuses. But still, it, what else would you uh, adopt to speak of uncertainty? Um, in in GWAS, once the field adopted 10 to minus 8, uh, it kind of a community gets cleaned up. We, we, our reproducibility just skyrocketed. Uh, way better than the Canada gene uh, age, where the reproducibility is hor horrible. So, so we look at 10 to minus 8 as our, our guardian, guardian of our reputation. Of, and we can transmit the knowledge from one study to the next. So that's quite useful. I just want to thank everybody for their attention. And I think this was a great talk. If we could just give one more thanks to our speakers. Thank you.